If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open them to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We continue with our study on interpretation of the Bible. This morning, I'd like to touch on some ground I have touched on before and then move on to one other thing. One of the most important things in the study of Scripture is grammar and the root and meaning of words. Words change their meaning. I think probably the best way to demonstrate that is an example given by D.A. Carson, a very fine biblical scholar, in a book entitled Exegetical Fallacies. And in that book he points out that the word martyr, M-A-R-T-Y-R, underwent some very consistent change throughout history over, literally, 2,000 years. The first meaning of the word in the Greek, which was martos, which we translate in our word martyr, was one who gives evidence in or out of a court of law. That was the original root meaning of the word, one who gives evidence in or out of a court of law. As time went on, it was one who gives solemn witness or affirmation of one's faith. As time went on, it became one who witnesses to personal faith, even the threat of death. Then it became one who witnesses to personal faith by the willingness to accept death. And it finally ended up one who dies for a cause, a martyr. Now here are five stages the root, and four others. And it shows how words change their meaning and how you get what is called semantic obsolescence. That is, a word becomes obsolete in its original meaning and then you have to continuously see how the word has changed according to context and culture. I think it's very significant that when we study the New Testament, we sometimes get hung up on words, and I get questions on this all the time. Gr grammar is a very important thing. But grammar without context, grammar without comparison to other texts, can become very hazardous. For instance, there are books out on word studies of the New Testament. That's really the study of what is called etymology. That's part of hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. Etymology the study of the meaning or roots of words. Yes, they're important. But when you have a word study, independent of the usage of the term through history, independent of the context in which the word appears, and independent of its usage generally at that time when that was written, then you get into obsolescence. I've heard people preach stirring messages on semantic obsolescence without even realizing that they're doing it. And Dr. Carson has some interesting observations on this. In John chapter 3, God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. King James Bible translates the Greek word monogenes, only begotten Son from the Greek root genos, G-E-N-O-S, which means, in its basic meaning, root, stock, breed, kind, or type. That's its basic root concept. So when they got to John 3, very learned scholars, commentators, spoke of Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God. The Arian heretics came along in the 3rd century, following Arius of Alexandria, a heretic, and they said, if Jesus Christ is monogenes, he is the only one created in a unique way, generated, genos. So they taught that Jesus Christ was a second god generated by his father who was the first god. All that from one Greek word, monogenes. You say, well, what has that got to do with us today? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with you today. 
the people that are the descendants of the Aryans are the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they are coming into your living room and onto your doorstep telling you that Jesus Christ is a created being, monogenes, only begotten Son of God. And he's really Michael the Archangel who became the Redeemer, but he is uniquely a creature. Now in John 3, the word monogenes appears. And it is translated only begotten. That is an incorrect translation. It's incorrect from the word's usage. It's incorrect from its context. But the actual meaning of the word is only generated, monogenes. That's the root. But it changed. Your new international version. Who has a new international version here this morning? All right. Read me John 3.16 in the international, new international version. Ah, we got it. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. But the angels are called the sons of God in the book of Job, are they not? Is not Adam called the son of God? Certainly, in Luke. Are we not called, beloved now are we the sons of God? It does not yet appear what we shall be. We know when he appears we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. Well then, what in the world are we talking about here? His one and only son. Answer. The meaning of the word is unique son. One of a kind. Jesus Christ is one of a kind. One of a type. He is unique. That's why the French translation of John 3, long ago, got it right. He is the unique Son of God. How is He unique? He is the only one who actually partakes of the nature of His Father. He is the only one who shares eternity with God as the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's his uniqueness. God actually appearing in human flesh. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only, his unique Son, that whoever believes in him should never perish, but have everlasting life. Then, because of this, John chapter 1 takes on a new meaning. No one has ever seen God, John 1, 18, at any time, but the one and only Son, the unique, one-of-a-kind Son. He has revealed Him. No one, Jesus said, knows the Father but the Son, and no one knows the Son but the Father. And you cannot know the Father unless the Son reveals Him to you. He is the revealer of the invisible God. He is the reflection and image of God himself in human flesh. And he's more than that. He's the nature of God himself in human flesh. Hebrews chapter 1. You see how important it is to tie the verses together? Hebrews chapter 1. God, who at different times and different ways in times past spoke to our fathers and the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us in his Son, whom he appointed the inheritor of all things through whom he created the universe. Now listen carefully. This is his uniqueness. The radiance of the glory of God. The word effulgence. The outshining of the Shekinah of Yahweh Elohim. That's who the Son is. He is the blinding blast of the glory of God masked in human flesh. He is the character, hupastasios tes character. He is the nature and character of God himself stamped into human flesh. Monogenes is unique. How is he unique? He is uniquely God, uniquely deity, uniquely eternal. Not begotten, monogenes, but one of a kind. 
the one and only Son. This is derived from the Old Testament passages from the Hebrew word Yachid, which tells us about being alone, the unique one of a kind. And finally, in Hebrews 11, chapter 17, where Isaac is called Monogenes, the only begotten son of Abraham, the unique son of Abraham. Well, he wasn't the only begotten son of Abraham. Abraham had other children by Keturah. Is that not true? Genesis 25? Is it not true that Abraham had an illegitimate child before Isaac? That that child's name was Ishmael? Yes. Then how can the writer of Hebrews call him only begotten? If you take the word to mean only generated, it falls apart. It actually means Isaac is the unique son. Why is Isaac the unique son of Abraham? He is the one of a kind who came by what? Promise. So once you put Hebrews 11:17 together with John 3:16 and John 1:18, the meaning of monogenes translated only begotten changes. It is not the only one generated. It is the unique one of a kind. As Isaac is one of a kind, Jesus Christ is uniquely God and man, one of a kind. Now, there are lots of other illustrations of this. I wish we had the time to go into them. I'm going to give you three that will make it very clear how you can avoid the fallacy of what is known in hermeneutics as semantic anachronism. How do you like that for a 50 cent word? Semantic is linguistic. Anachronism, you ought to know. Something that's out of its historical order. Semantic anachronism. Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. How many pastors have you heard preach on the dynamite of God? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the dunamis of God. Pastor gets up there. He says, this word dunamis, this word is actually the root word for our word dynamite. And Jesus Christ's gospel is the dynamite of God. That's an anachronism. That's a semantic jungle. It doesn't mean that at all. The word has totally changed its meaning. What we've done is to take a contemporary meaning of dynamite and read it back into the Greek word dunamis. Dynamite blows everything apart. That's not the intent of Romans 1.16. For Paul, the gospel isn't the TNT that blows everything apart. For Paul, it is the power of the resurrection. In other words, the empty tomb. Jesus Christ came out of the tomb. It's empty. The power of God is out in the world. Doing what? Transforming the lives of people. I've blown them apart. How many preachers get up there and preach on this semantic anachronism? Reading back into it the word dynamite. Forget it. The word dynamite won't fit. That's what happens when you abuse grammar and etymology. Etymology is a 50 cent word, which means the origin of words. I was once in East Rutherford, New Jersey, at the headquarters of a cult. The cult is called the Dawn Bible Students. They have a program on radio and television called Frank and Ernest, where two guys talk frankly and earnestly. I talk to them. They are neither Frank nor Ernest. <laughs> They're deceivers. But Frank and I had a nice chat. And Frank said to me, you believe in eternal punishment. I said, that's right. He says, don't you know that the root meaning of the word for punishment isn't torture? It's to test you. He said, it's from the Greek word which means touchstone. And I looked at him for a moment and I said, so what? He said, well, if it's a touchstone or a test, it has nothing whatever to do with punishment. That semantic acronym in which you are reading into it 
An old meaning is gone. The word changed, just like martyr did. And it ends up in the book of Revelation as the wrath, or gaze, and thumos, and judgment of God, and they that reject the gospel, says John, will undergo eonion besanhaizontai, the same word as in Matthew chapter 25, eternal punishment, everlasting, never-ending punishment. The word changes its meaning. But people read things into it in order to escape the idea of the word. Second illustration, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. God loves a cheerful giver. He does. And I've joked with you sometimes by saying, actually the Greek word is hilaron, from which we get our word hilarious. And I kid you by saying, the Lord loves a hilarious giver. I do not mean by that that we should play a laugh track at, at offering time. <laughs> what I mean is, the attitude of the heart is to be based on love and out of devotion to Christ. And that when you give, you should give that way. Now you notice I'm speaking on this text after the offering, so you cannot claim that I'm reaching for your pocketbook. The offering's been taken. But how many preachers get up there and really seriously preach, not jokingly as I do, really seriously preach, you should give hilariously with reckless abandonment. God, oh, that's awful. That's not the meaning at all. Obviously, the meaning has changed. We're taking the meaning here, hilarious, and reading it back into the Word and saying, there we are, that's it. No, that's a semantic anachronism. We're reading it back. That's not what the Word means. The Word is actually telling you to give out of a heart dedicated in love and devotion and with an attitude of cheerfulness. In other words, willingness to give. The Lord loves a willing attitude of giving. There's a third one. In Christianity today, 1983, they ran a series of articles which Dr. Carson got very upset about, and after I read it, I understood why, in which they were talking about the miraculous power of blood and how the blood of Jesus Christ can be understood in the light of our modern knowledge of hematology, which is the science of blood analysis. You go into a hospital and you see a sign on the wall that says, Hematology Department. What are they talking about? Blood. So Christianity Today published three articles and spoke about the miraculous cleansing power of blood. Just as blood flushes out cellular impurities and transport nourishment to every part of the body, so the blood of Jesus Christ does this in your life. What? The blood of Jesus was red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma. He was a normal human being. John MacArthur is right when he points out that we have become so obsessed with the term blood in the New Testament that we have forgotten the actual meaning behind it. The meaning behind red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma is sacrifice. Jesus Christ sacrificed his life on the cross for you and for me. We lay claim to that by faith. We are cleansed by the sacrificial death of Jesus who died in our place, and the blood is the symbol of the sacrifice. We, however, have shifted over so that the blood itself forgetting what it represents, absorbs our thoughts. For instance, how many times have you heard people say, we've got to plead the blood? Plead red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma? That's what blood is. They don't really mean that. What they really mean is, Jesus died and the merits of his sacrifice we plead before God. Isn't that right? 
When you get down on your knees, you say, Lord Jesus, because of what you did for me on the cross, you shed your blood for me, you died in my place, I come into your presence. That's how you talk to God. You know perfectly well if you stop and think about it, you are not talking about hemoglobin, plasma, and corpuscles. You're talking about what it represents. Dr. Carson points out, and I quite agree, that Jesus Christ accomplished by his death, he achieved by his death on the cross, our justification. He achieved by his death on the cross our redemption. He achieved by his death on the cross our resurrection. The blood was the symbol of God's triumph. Red and white corpuscles, hemoglobin and plasma are the same as ours. But the life was different. The life that was sacrificed on the cross was the life of God in human flesh. Therefore, one drop of his blood was worth more than all the hemoglobin, corpuscles, and plasma in the entire history of the world because it represented the exchange of the perfection of God for the imperfection of man. That's why it's valuable. Now, don't sit here and say, Walter Martin doesn't believe in the blood of Jesus. Walter Martin lives under the blood of Jesus, which is the symbol of God's sacrifice for my sins. If I were not covered by that sacrifice, if you were not covered by that sacrifice, we would be eternally lost. But let's not become so absorbed with the vehicle of redemption that we forget the essence of redemption. And the essence of redemption was the life of God which was exchanged for your life and my life on the cross. I like this statement from Dr. Carson. I'm going to close with it. He says, If John tells us that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ purifies us from every sin, he is informing us that our hope for continued cleansing and forgiveness does not rest on protestations of our goodness while our life is a sham, but on a continual walking in the light and on continued reliance on Christ's finished work on the cross. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin, could easily be translated. And the sacrifice, the offering of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us. The benefit of what he did on the cross. He presented in heaven his own blood. What does it mean? Did Jesus actually take five quarts of hemoglobin and red and white corpuscles into heaven itself, into a literal tabernacle, and sprinkle them on the mercy seat? Or is this a figure of Jesus Christ rose from the dead and presented himself alive in heaven with the merits of his sacrifice for our sins? He paid the price for it all. We have a danger in forgetting semantic anachronisms. We have a danger in absorption with grammar. We have a danger in digging into word studies, ignoring context and historic usage. There is a danger, even a heretical danger, of being led astray when we are terribly sincere, but we're not doing our homework. Am I against word studies? Oh, no. Vincent's word studies, excellent. Vine, excellent. Robertson, excellent. I use them myself, they're great. But they're scholars who tie it all together so you don't get these errors. Now, I don't expect you to become exegetical scholars. That takes a long time. But through this series of messages, I want to acquaint you with the things you can avoid and thus increase the capacity for learning and for appreciation of the Word of God. And also to show you why evangelists and why people who don't do their homework can get you in an awful lot of trouble. Even writing in Christianity Today 
if you don't know how to test it and you don't know what to look for. Next time you hear John 3.16, remember what it really means. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only unique son that whoever believes in him should never perish but have eternal life. The message of redemption never changes. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Our Father, we worship you, praising you and thanking you for the Lord Jesus and for Calvary. Lord, these are very deep things that we go into in terms of the meaning of thy word and of words themselves, which are vehicles of thought. We ask you in Jesus' name to guide and guard us, to instruct us in the sanctity and the sacredness of thy word, so that we may approach it as Moses approached the burning bush, removing his feet, his shoes, because we are on holy ground. O oh God, our Father, bless thy word to our hearts and to our minds. Cleanse us of our sins. Make us vessels fit for thy usage. Give us a deeper appreciation, a keener understanding of thy word. In the name of thy Son, Jesus, we ask with thanksgiving. Amen.